Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we are going to take a look at the Science of Chutlan Battlefleet set, which is both the largest box ever released for the Scandinavian subfaction for the Imperium and also one of the largest mercenaries box that have been released for the games. Because yes, the Science of Jutland are mercenaries and thus they can be played under certain circumstances in any other nation's uh, fleet composition. So this is quite an interesting box. As you will see, it's quite massive and it has a very, very fun play style. So let's talk about this today. We'll first have a look at uh, what is inside the box. Then we will detail each and every variant that you can build. And as you will see, there are quite a few. And then we will uh, switch to uh, how you can expand once you have bought this box with other ships, especially those of the Imperium, of course, uh, if you want to expand on the Scandinavian theme of the faction. So first of all, we are going to talk about the uh, Imperium playstyle. So the thing about the Imperium is that the Imperium has a lot of esoteric weapons uh, because they have their own variation on uh, gun batteries, rockets, torpedoes, etc. Uh, they usually, usually have a little bit less dices, but they gain, for example, the keyword Voltaic which piles up disorder a bit faster, uh, which is fine. Um, it's a bit annoying because you need to remember the keywords and the dice values and stuff. But usually it's a slight power boost. They also have a lot of uh, very powerful electrical weapons, like purely electrical, such as the storm cloud, heavy storm clouds and the storm bringers. Uh, those are really powerful and the Scandinavians have a lot of those. So that is a good point. They're the Imperium in general, but especially the Scandinavians, are very fast. They are very lethal, especially at point blank, which is where the uh, Scandinavians want to be. And they are very good at boarding. Uh, again, Scandinavians even more than Prussians. And they are quite uh, glass cannon. They are usually tough-ish, um, but for the points cost, they are fragile. Like they are not, uh, they will not melt in a few seconds, like you might see in other factions when they have very uh, like glass cannon units, they are very fragile. Here, uh, even Scandinavians, uh, they will hold for a little bit. They sometimes have a little bit less uh, hull points, a little bit less citadel, but they are usually quite fine defense-wise. Uh, however, you do pay a price because they are fast, they are deadly. Uh, if they weren't cheap as well, that would be completely OP. The Imperium is a strong faction, but come on. The uh, Scandinavians especially are very fun uh, at for boarding action. They are basically the best boarders of the game. Uh, period, and uh, their all their game plan is around hiding, getting to at least closing range, maybe point blank range, and then boarding. The fun thing about Scandinavians as well, uh, and signs of Jutland or only Scandinavians, is that when they get crippled, uh, they can usually keep shooting at full efficiency, and uh, especially with the gunnery weapons, and they also keep uh, boarding at the same power, or even they board a little bit better when they're crippled. So that is quite fun. I will not go too much in details of how the Scandinavians play, but I think you got the idea. They are techno cyber steampunk viking, which is, let's admit, quite cool. So what do you get inside the science of Chutland box? Uh, first of all, the th thing to say is that it is an expensive box. It's more than 100 euros, like 102 euros, uh, which means that it is the largest uh, box that are sold for dystopian wars if you uh, accept all the two-player starter box sets and the Ice Maiden, of course. This means, though, that you do get a ton of ships. I don't know if you can see, like, if you can see all these little ships, but you do have, like, dozens of them. Uh, it's a lot. Some of them are really, really big. Some of them are small, of course. And the main centerpiece that you will get is the Scandinavian Dreadnought. We already had a Ragnarok, which was a mass 3, like, battleship, classic. Uh, this guy, the Valhalla, and all its named variants, is like this, but even stronger. We'll see that it looks extremely cool, uh, and it's very, very efficient and such a joy to play. We'll talk about uh, each variant in a minute. You also have two Scandinavian frontline cruisers, uh, those we knew from the Ragnarok box set. Three variants, they are fast to deadly, like they are the archetype of the Scandinavians. They have their own specificity, and some of them are very fun and fluffy, especially the Odin, for example. Uh, they are uh, generalist combat ships. 
This is not the case for the Scandinavian support cruisers. As you can see, first of all, there is a lot of variations. I forgot one of them on the list, which is the latest new 3.05 orbit uh, anti-air cruiser. But each of the variants you can see is very specialized. As we said, there is an anti-air uh, cruiser. There is a support, like a very like uh, escort uh, cheap uh, merchantman cruiser. There is also like a submarine carrier. There is one that teleports around, one that makes reconnaissance uh, for the other ships, one that is made for ramming actions. Like all of them are very different and they are way more specialized. They're usually a little bit more expensive and they do what they want to do very good, but to the exception of the other combat role. You also get in the box four half heavy corvettes, mass one ships that are very good both in their own pack of unit of uh, ships and as well uh, when they are attached, especially to the flagships, but also a little bit when you attach them to other units. You get these two uh, Valkyrie hunt rotors on the left, the little flying ships that, spoiler, can be attached to the Odin in a very, very cool way. Uh, you have four Fenrir hunter submarines, uh, extremely efficient and quite cool looking submarines. And finally, but absolutely not least, you get two Einerjahr Vitruvian Colossi. And those, guy, um, those guys are very, very powerful. Um, they are probably my favorite robots of the entire game, both in terms of design, I just love how they look, uh, and in terms of gameplay. They are expensive, yes, but they are tough and they are such a nuisance for your opponent. You also have four Imperium Escort tokens, which is good because you it's the first box where you get some of those. And you also have some tokens for the submarines that can be sent by the support cruisers or by the Valhalla itself. So we have now uh, seen what is inside the box. Let's take a look at each ship, each variant that you can build and how to play them. The first variant that we will see is the Valhalla Fast Dreadnought, which is the ship that gives its name to the box. Uh, the first thing that you will notice is that it is very, very expensive at 338 points. Uh, it is more expensive than even, if I compare for the Imperium, even the Tirpitz, which is the named uh, Kaiser Elector, that, uh, the cool one that teleports around, uh, the very good, like, the, this very good ship, is cheaper than the Valhalla. So this already makes you think like, well, okay, it must be really good, the Valhalla, to be more expensive than that. Uh, spoiler, yes. <laughs> this thing is Armor 8, very good for a battleship, like uh, you, you wouldn't expect less. Citadel 15, which is uh, starts to be like, oh wow, 15, I expected more, and yeah, well, it's remember, it's Scandinavian, they are meant to be glass cannons. Nine whole points uh, before they get crippled, and uh, five after they get crippled is fine. Uh, it's not the best uh, whole point repartition we've seen, but remember, remember that uh, they, this little guy will keep fighting at near full potential, uh, even when it is crippled, and you can see that when it gets crippled, it frays one pip higher than before, so that, uh, that is something uh, to consider. And the, the two things that make him, three things that make him extremely interesting is that he has good weaponries, he can send uh, submarines, and it boards like a little devil, or like a big devil, to be honest. Its weapons, first of all, he has two, and I said two Stormbringers to the front, which will obliterate uh, two ships a turn, uh, no questions asked. It also has heavy firepower, so you can combine it as well. I would recommend to combine it with the three heavy gun batteries that you can have for free up there. And just from that, just from that, it's already, already like a ton of firepower. It, this is absolutely insane. Like all like two Stormbringers and three heavy gun batteries is already like way up there in terms of firepower. It's uh, hard to overstate how much a this can devastate the enemy fleet just by itself. And this is not the core of what the Valhalla is doing, but this is already something that will uh, deal so much damage to your opponent. There is very little that the opponent can do to try to prevent this. If you point your Valhalla to the opponent, you will um, kill at least a couple ships every turn. Uh, beyond that, it can send uh, four Valhalla mag midget subs, which is um, well quite uh, significant as well. Those are kind of like SRS token, but you can send them a little bit less further away. And well, they are submerged. Like I will not go too much in details, but they are quite good, uh, very efficient, and it's a complement of the firepower that you have. And it means that even if you start the turn one or turn two and you try to stay hidden behind islands, you can still contribute 
uh, to the combat, which is which is really good. And finally, finally, and this is where it gets uh, really crazy. Uh, you have a fray of 15 by default with uh, Wolves of the Sea and Voltaic Deck Sweepers, and 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 a few regenerator. Um, I will skip the details of the rules, but basically what it means is that no matter who you board, you will get a carnage result. Like you can board the toughest sit, um, battleship of the game with all its escort ships around. If you board him with a Valhalla, you will get the best result possible because no one resists to something that will be freight 20 plus devastating reroll sustain. Like you just don't, except if you have extremely bad luck with your dices and your opponent is very lucky. Uh, there is no way you don't succeed uh, to make a carnage result. The Valhalla is probably the best boarding ship of the game, so that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, but still, still, uh, this means that this ship is just such great value. It is toughish, as we've seen. It is fast, with this we didn't say, but yeah, fast dreadnought is not uh, mistaken, uh, because you are mass 4, speed 6, and you have a fury generator, and hammer sweep if you want to go even faster. So this thing is really, really fast. It has heavy both sides, of course, and uh, yeah, it is tough, fast, lots of firepower, especially with the two Stormbringers, and it boards crazily, and you really need to kill it uh, up until the last uh, hold point, otherwise it keeps boarding you uh, and shooting you, and it sends SLS tokens. Like, what, what could make it even better? Well, I'm gonna tell you <laughs> what's gonna make it even better. You can replace one of the uh, heavy gun batteries that you see in the front uh, with a shroud generator. Uh, if you do this, if you do this, you lose a little bit of firepower, but whatever, whatever, really, honestly. And uh, in exchange, you gain so much <laughs> resilience, because this Valhalla is going to be way up there on the target priority of your opponent. If you put some escorts, which you absolutely should, you can take three escorts, take them 100% of the time, because torpedoes will be your weakness then. If you put uh, escorts and you also put two Hoth Corvettes, which will boost your defenses by plus uh, three. Uh, this means you will start to get uh, ADV of 16 and SDV of 12. And uh, now you start to be quite uh, fine if you're, the enemy shoots you with uh, torpe torpedoes. Anything less than an absolute massive barrage of torpedoes, you will be fine. And yeah, when you start to be armor 8, uh, Citadel 15, shrouded with ADV of uh, 16, uh, let me tell you that the enemy is not laughing at all when he knows that you want to charge him and get at point blanks and board him. Uh, this ship is absolutely insane. Uh, it is extremely fun to play. Uh, it is lethal. It's like a cruise missile that you will point at your opponent with a shroud and you will say like, okay, try to deal with this. Uh, you can hide, it's even better, but even if you don't hide, you're tough enough to absorb quite a bit of firepower. And when you will get at point blank, well, as we say, uh, this is where the fun begins. Really, if you buy this box, I would highly recommend the Valhalla. It's my favorite ship, it looks amazing, and uh, it's just such a joy to play. Probably one of the coolest ships to play in the entire game. Now we're going to go for the Skilden. Uh, the Skilden is a little bit... Um, I will not say disappointing, but when you compare it to the Valhalla, I'm not sure it justifies uh, to uh, the difference. However, however, the Skilden, uh, I hope I pronounced it right, is one of the two ships that you need if you want to play the mercenary battle fleet. So be careful about that because uh, if you do uh, want to play your Scandinavians in, for example, an alliance force or in a union force, etc., etc., you will need to play the Skelden and not the Valhalla. Uh, apart from that, this uh, nice little ship has some differences. First of all, uh, it does not send uh, the midget subs, uh, a little bit sad. It does have Valkyrie support, uh, which means that you can attach some Valkyries. Uh, fine, but you want to attach your Valkyries to your Odin, as we'll see. And you want to attach some Hoth to the Skilden, so do you really want that? Eh? And uh, they do gain the Valkyries advanced storm calls, which is something, which means they can link better. Uh, good, good. Uh, I still think you want to usually to attach Hoth and to keep your Valkyries for your Odins, but if you want to play a fluffy list, attaching two Valkyries to the Skeleton can be fun, can be fun, for sure, no questions. Uh, it still has everything else. It does trade one small rocket battery for Freyare. Fine, it has advanced repair facilities too, which starts to be quite good. Uh, you will send six dices, which means on average you will heal 
uh, hull point per activation. Good. It does get aerial platform, aerial repair platform, sorry, which means that uh, you will gain a feel no pain of 5 plus, basically. Um, sorry, not a feel no pain. Uh, if you lose uh, one of your Valkyrie around or another aerial unit, uh, for, for like whoever it can be, uh, for example, the very powerful Munich for the Imperium, if they die in the range of the ability, which is not huge, I think it's 7 inches, so not huge, uh, you will send a dice and you will have uh, one chance out of three to save your ship and it stays alive with uh, one whole point. Uh, it's a fine ability, especially if you attach uh, your Valkyries, but it's not very reliable, so I would not count on this too much. But uh, if you do have an air fleet, it's quite interesting to have this uh, capacity. Apart from that, what we said about the um, Valhalla is still the same, except this guy boards even better. It goes to free 17 when it's crippled, and it can take four escort tokens. So if you put all the... I will not even calculate, but I think you end up with 25 plus, especially if you have attached ships. Of, you, there is nothing that resists the boarding from this guy. And it can be even more resilient because you can take one extra uh, escort token. So if you want to really want to make one very tough cookie, uh, the Skeldian might be even tougher than the Valhalla, actually. Now we go to the Asgard a Rotor Tether Ship. I know that some people don't like it because they were expecting something else with the name Asgard, some very cool uh, battle carrier. Uh, the Asgard is uh, interesting in its uh, design, but a little bit sad that you need to sacrifice your Odin if you want to uh, fill up the Asgard with the uh, aircraft that it's carrying. Uh, because if you build the Asgard as you see on the picture, you will not have the miniatures uh, needed to be able to build uh, your Valkyries. So, hey. Uh, what does it get? It gets Hooved Targeting Array, which is a fine rule. It has an inbuilt shield generator. This is quite interesting makes it a little bit tougher, even though Shroud might have been preferable. Uh, advanced Repair Facilities 3, a little bit better than the Skeldon, fine. Also Aerial Repair Platform, and it has something called a Ride of the Valkyrie, which is, which is a good rule in of itself. It means you can spam the Valkyrie uh, rotors, good. However, however, you are limited by the amount of Valkyries that you get in the box, because if you build a Skeldon as you see, so with the ships on, you don't have any Valkyries uh, to benefit from the rule. And you will need to buy a lot, and I mean a lot, of uh, <laughs> um, Scandinavian support fleets, uh, squadrons, if you want to benefit to, of this rule to the maximum. So it's a fine rule, it's a fine ship in theory, spamming Valkyries is, sounds extremely fun. However, you will be physically limited, limited by the number of Valkyries you will physically own. Uh, because it, they're quite hard to get your hands on. And if you want to spam the Valkyries and get dozens and dozens of them on the table, which this Asgard allows, uh, good luck finding the models. Otherwise, it does still have a twin Stormbringer, which is good. But apart from that, like it's a good support ship, but you trade so much just to have the whole targeting array and the ride of the Valkyrie, that I'm like, is it worth it? Uh, I don't know. It is extremely cheaper, yes, it's 254 points, uh, which when you consider uh, what you get for a ship that can board and still has two uh, Stormbringer is actually fine, like points per uh, resilience and points per damage. Maybe it's even higher uh, than the Valhalla, maybe, I'm not sure, but could be. However, it's so much more fun and cool to play the Valhalla because it has more firepower and it has the submarine and stuff. I am still very much not convinced by the Asgard. Uh, plus, in my opinion, it doesn't look very good, so that is something. However, uh, its reduced price does make it uh, interesting. If you built your ship as an Asgard, don't think like, oh my god, what a mistake. Use it as a cheap boarding uh, force that you will just, again, throw as a missile, but really like just point it. It has much less weaponry, less tricks and stuff. Just throw it, it has, consider that it's a boarding ship, a very good boarding ship with two uh, Stormbringers and that's it. And use the, all the other little rules as a nice to have bonus but not at the core of the ship. And then I don't have the picture but uh, it's a recent addition in 3.05, it's the Skagerrak. And this thing is a named variant of the Asgard, 
Uh, it is one of the ships that can lead a signs of Jutland battle fleet. So if you want to play them as mercenaries, this is what you will need to bring. And this guy is basically an Asgard uh, with a little bit better advanced repair facilities. As a, <laughs> it means it will launch eight dice. It starts to be a lot. Uh, it also has uh, Stormbringers and stuff. And, well, it's basically a little better uh, Asgard. If you don't know uh, which ship to take, and it's exactly the same for you. Maybe take the Askagarak. It's a little bit better, uh, I would say. Not insanely so. It does trade the Hoved targeting array for the Droger rule, which is a little bit of a downgrade, I would say, but not that much. And for minus six points um, for a ship that still does exactly what it wants to do, which is, as we said, point it uh, as a missile and consider it's a twin Stormbreaker battleship with great boarding. Uh, it, it does it even better and a higher value of repair facilities means you have a higher chance to uh, survive the enemy firepower and to repair yourself which means that it does its role even a little bit better so the Skagirak gets a thumbs up for me compared to the Asgard even though again uh, I would recommend uh, all the players if they can even if they want to play Scandinavians to play the Valhalla and otherwise Otherwise, to play this Kjelden. I know usually I try to say the good things about each uh, variant, but here I love so much the Valhalla and the Kjelden that it's hard to uh, recommend uh, something else than these two ships. And now we start to have a look at uh, the frontline cruisers for the Scandinavians. And we start with the Gungnir, which, as we can see, is both cheap, very cheap, and both very fragile. It has only three hull points uh, before it gets crippled, which is sad, but again, remember that when you get crippled, you don't lose as much as uh, Scandinavians. And it has two things. It has a heavy Sturmklau, uh, which is this big electric gun in the hull in the front. And it has a Volt gun battery in the rear, which you can and you probably will upgrade as a Sturmklau, so you can link and get even more firepower. Well, at least that's what I would recommend you to do. Uh, the Gungnir has some funky tricks, especially it has power slides, which means it is surprisingly agile. And as you've seen of some of our battle report, uh, you turn one, you can really point it just behind an island, considering that you will power slide on the first turn and then move. So it's easier to hide on the first turn, which is something that we like. And it also has an amazing uh, fray value of 9 with Wolves of the Sea, uh, which will really boost you. Uh, like this is really good plus you have armor sweep so if you make a ramming it's even better and you're even faster and for 76 points uh, I really like it I really like it it is fragile yes uh, Citadel 11 is sad uh, three whole points uh, before it gets crippled is fine but it means uh, that you have only seven whole points in total yes but again it's a, I think it's a great package for the price uh, it does have vulnerable stern which means that enemies in the rear will absolutely devastate you but apart from that, I do think it is a very, very good ship. And I like my Gungnir. I have one built. And it's a very nice and good and uh, efficient, cheap activation. Then we have the Odin Reaver. And this guy, this guy. Uh, first of all, uh, the ship looks good. Like, uh, well, I'm a bit partial. I just really like the design of the Scandinavians. And it's a more expensive uh, Gungnir with a 4 slash 3 hull points. So it gets crippled a little bit later, but the total of hull point doesn't change. What does change is that it has an heavy volt gun battery on the top. Uh, that is really something. Uh, it means that if you start to have two or three uh, Odins, you can really combine their firepower. Very good. And you can also reduce the price of your Odin by minus five, going to 85. So quite close then to uh, a Gungnir. Uh, and you gain then, uh, for example, a shield or shroud. For uh, such ships, uh, I uh, think I would recommend the shields because you have low citadel value and you are quite fragile. So it will be quite rare if, when your opponent will dedicate extreme amount of firepowers to defeat you. Uh, usually against the ships like this with only 11 of citadels, um, what you want to do in this game is to make more attacks uh, where you just barely try to breach the citadels. Against these attacks that usually have between 10 and 12 dices, uh, it's usually more interesting to have shields uh, than shrouds, uh, st statistically. Of course, uh, if the enemy starts to put a lot, lot, lots of dices, it's better to have shroud. 
but minus two dices will really annoy your opponents if he uses one of the common weapons like heavy gun batteries or rock heavy rocket batteries and stuff. It will really annoy your opponent in its calculations uh, to try to breach uh, your citadel. And the main thing that actually uh, separates the Odin not only from the Kungni but from any other Scandinavian ship in the game is the Hugin and Munin, I hope it's the right name, uh, special rule, which means that uh, first of all, as we will see, uh, Valkyries can be attached to your Odin. Okay, very good. It makes a, first of all, it looks great on the table, and second of all, uh, it's fluffy because the, these are the two uh, Raven of uh, Odin in the mythology. Very cool. And you gain, for all your weapons, minus two to the enemy citadel when you shoot with your Odin on a target that is visible to uh, Valkyrie Hunt Rotters. And minus two citadel on something that has uh, potentially yes uh, heavy Vulcan batteries and especially heavy storm clouds and even broadsides. Uh, let me tell you that this makes a huge huge difference, and uh, it makes me want to have more and more Odins. Like it's not very realistic because if you want to be fluffy, you should have one Odin and two Valkyries. Uh, but I have two Odins and I love this little combo. Three starts to be a little bit greedy, but still very good at 90 points or 85 if you put a shield. These are still efficient ships, so 3 Odin starts to be a threat and gets high on your enemy's radar, so you, the enemy will focus you down and try to get you. But uh, 2 Odins with 2 Valkyries uh, doesn't look like much, it's not that much, that, that many points. And let me tell you that when you will get at point blank, you will really, really bring the hurt. And you will easily get, uh, like even more easily get point blank range because the Odin have Vanguard. Vanguard meaning you move five inches bef uh, like just before the first turn of the game. Can help you to get closer to the enemy of course and can help you to get in cover so, uh, somewhere in the middle of the table so the enemy doesn't get as many as good a line of sight on you as he could. So I really really like the Odin. And talking about ships I really like. Well I'm spoiler like most of the Scandinavian ships are very cool and fun and I love them all. Um, speaking of ships, I really like the Jotun Heavy Raiders. So this guy is more expensive at 113, and then you're like, oh yeah, 113, we start to get to like a big cruiser uh, points cost. Uh, even though like if you compare with some uh, default uh, cruisers of other factions, like the Yorktown, or the Union for example is 108, uh, 113 is not that much. But this guy, this guy, has some crazy, crazy firepower. Uh, it does stay at Citadel 11 and Armor 6, uh, which is mean, it means it is quite a glass cannon because uh, you will start to pile up the critical damage uh, very fast with your Yotuns, and um, you do have quite a few hull points, 5 in battle ready and 4 in cripple, which is uh, 2 hull points more than, uh, for example, the Odin. Big difference. But you still have Citadel 11, which keeps you like down on the ground like you don't don't think you're a huge tank uh, just because you have more hull points uh, you are tankier absolutely no questions but don't think you are the huge tank of the army what you are though is a big damage dealer you still have the possibility of getting a shield or shroud uh, on this uh, Yotun more than on the Odin it is um, a good idea probably to get a shroud because these guys have a whole lot of hull points so your enemy might be willing to really put huge attacks on you to aim for the double citadel absolutely what you do get is the full package you have heavy storm clouds you have a small storm cloud on well, the Volgan battery that you will upgrade as a normal storm cloud and you also have the heavy Volgan battery the one that you can either keep uh, as it is or bring a shroud it is not a crazy bad idea to keep the heavy Volgan batteries especially if like me you plan on making a big pack of uh, three uh, Yotuns, because then you can combine all their heavy volt gun batteries even at long range. And thanks to focus gunnery, um, the, you will reroll blanks and get plus two dices. So it means that your Yotuns, even at long range, can bring a reasonable amount of firepower on any enemy ship. What I would recommend to do, and what I do for myself, is I replace the heavy volt gun battery. I play the Yotuns more conservatively on the first couple turns, really hiding behind islands and uh, using my shroud, because I use a shroud, to stay alive. Because what they really want to do, like all the others, is to get at point blank, to combine their 
AV Storm Clouds and Storm Clouds together. Uh, those weapons, for example, ignore Shield Generator, for, uh, and they're like they're devastating. They're very good weapons, and they want to board as well. They have a great uh, boarding profile uh, with a Frey 10, and if you, they also have Wolves of the Sea, and it means that if you uh, combine all of these together, you will devastate couple ships at least at uh, point blank range if you have three Yotuns between all the weapons that you will combine and with a very good fray and wolves of the sea you will just create a carnage on whichever ship you target and remember last thing but absolutely not least that focus gunnery can be used on the storm ring uh, sorry on the heavy storm clouds because those are gunnery weapons so they are sustained already if i'm not mistaken or but regardless uh when you start to put rerolls on the storm clouds, which are devastating, whew, that starts to be a naughty, naughty combo. So yeah, the heavy storm clouds absolutely love focus gunnery. The U2 for 113 is not as tough as you might think, but it's a very, very good ship that will put the hurt on your opponent, both with its uh, storm clouds and heavy storm clouds and with its boarding. As soon as it gets in range, uh, you can also take the Voltaic Deck Sweeper for plus 5 per mold to boost uh, the boarding capacity. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend, you already have a good uh, boarding value. If you know that you're going to aim uh, at boarding, for example, uh, huge battleships of the enemy, then yes, it's worth it. But if the boarding uh, is going to be uh, against softer targets because you know you want to put them, for example, on the flanks and hunt for smaller cruisers or carriers or this kind of thing, uh, then it might not be worth it to make these uh, glass cannons even glassier for the points cost. All right, now we start to have a look at the ships that you can get with the support sprues of the Scandinavians. And we start with the Gefion Merchantman, which is one of the ships that you have to bring uh, if you want to have a legal um, science of Jutland battle fleet. So if you want to play them as mercenaries. And one thing I did not say, it was changed uh, recently, is that the Gefion is not anymore the only ship that uh, is obligatory to unlock the signs of Jutland Battlefleet. Uh, now you can either bring uh, the Gefion as your mandatory surface ship, or you can bring an Odin, which is the one we talked about with the uh, Valkyries around, uh, which is good, because if you uh, bring two Scions uh, Battlefleet, because you bought, for example, the Valhalla box twice, <laughs> crazy you, uh, it means that you will be able to um, seamlessly uh, legalize your fleets by having a Gefion. Having one is very good. Uh, and having this pack of Odin that we've been talking. Why did I say that is good, the Gefion? Well, it has logistical support rule, which gives you plus one card. It's a cards game as well. And having one more card is usually the difference between being able to make this very good uh, power that you wanted at the end of the turn or even gaining initiative. So having one ship for 68 points with a logistical support is good. It's also attachable, so you can attach it to any unit, and this is good because you can combine the broadside, but especially the storm clouds. Uh, this is something that is really good, and uh, everybody should want to combine their weapons, especially when they are so, so good. Also has a little shock rocket battery, whatever. Uh, you will probably replace it for a Freya Array uh, because a single shock rocket will never do anything, and the Freya Array is a little bit of utility in your fleet that we don't say no to. Uh, it also has landing vessel, but this we will not know what it does really until uh, we have more scenarios, like the first scenarios that will be released about uh, landings. But this might be in a little while. Next is going to be the Heimdall Recon Cruiser. And uh, this one is interesting. Uh, not my favorite, 110 points. Uh, Armor 6, Citadel 11, and 4 slash 4 hull points. Okay. It has the average storm claw. It has an inbuilt Hove targeting array. And it might be time to talk a little bit about the Hove targeting array uh, because we've seen it for the flagships. And the thing that it does is that any weapon with aerial quality in your entire fleet uh, gain extreme range, very good, and homing if the target is within 20 inches of a friendly model with this rule. And you cannot uh, deploy enemy ships within 10 of this model. And Fog of War rule, which might get uh, more popular, has no effect uh, on any target within 15. So different ranges, but you cannot deploy within 10 of a ship with this. Uh, fine, especially interesting on your Asgard, I would say, but this is fine as well. Uh, no Fog of War within 15, 
good, especially if you play with these kind of missions. If you know that in your playgroup you don't use the special missions, uh, this is whatever. And the thing that is interesting is that uh, all your rockets, and you can have some powerful rockets in the Imperium, maybe not that much with the Scandinavians, but the Prussians have ways to really pile up the rockets. Those will get extreme range, very good, and homing on within 20 inches, which is uh, considerable. The Asgard has it, and um, I didn't talk much about it, but it's fine because it also, as we said, the Asgard is a cruise missile that you want to throw uh, to the enemy. But if you only rely on your Asgard, uh, your enemy will just focus everything on the Asgard turn one and sink it down, and you will not be able to use it that much because the Asgard will need some time to reach the enemy lines. But the Heimdall, on the other hand, is not such a high priority target. It is. Uh, it only has a heavy storm cloud and uh, maybe a little rocket or maybe a little something more, but it's not great firepower. It has Frey 9. You will usually only have one of those. And it makes me say that when you're going to have a huge wave of uh, angry Scandinavians charging at your opponent, there is a big, big chance that uh, you will get in range within 20 inches with your Heimdall of the enemy fleet. And uh, when this happens, uh, you will be able to combo with all your rockets. It's a little bit sad that the Heimdall does not have something like, I don't know, forward deployment or something, because on the tables like what I feel is that by the time the aim dial will have crossed the table uh, and uh, get in range of the targets that you want to aim with the extreme range rockets and the homing uh, there is a chance that your ships already moved forward as well and the enemy ships have also gone closer so they are anyway not in extreme range anymore but in close uh, yeah in long range uh, there is a chance that through this uh, it's not very useful you can also keep them for turn two in strategic reserve but eh, again the same problem it might be a little bit too late that you trigger this too late in the sense that uh, extreme range is not needed anymore getting homing is fine uh, but i would say the heimdall is extremely good if you know you're going to play in the rules with fog of war yes uh, because then everything combos very well together uh, but if you only buy it for extreme range and homing i would say there are better ships then we go with the boulder uh, which is, again, quite interesting, and it's the one ship that might combo with the Heimdall because it has lots of rockets, as you can see. Uh, it has a rocket barrage, which is interesting, but the rockets uh, are mostly like uh, on the rear or on the side. It wants to show its side to the enemy to combo all its rockets together, and um, the, the sad thing about this is that it would combo good with the Heimdall, but it's the Balder that got uh, the rule uh, for um, Vanguard, allowing it to get closer to the enemy, which is a bit sad. Like I'm like, why? Like why does this guy want to go forward uh, when it really wants to show its side and the Aimdal stays in the back? Like it should be the other way around. The Aimdal front and the Boulder stays in the back to shoot with their extreme range rockets. Uh, but it is not the way it is. It's not a bad ship, how however, uh, you can have to the uh, like a shock rocket battery or a Freyare in the front. Um, I would. I would probably say like keep the shock rocket battery to the front. Uh, that, that is better because you you have rocket barrage and you will want to make a big combo of rockets. Uh, but again, it's not my favorite ship. I know some of them, some of the people on this Discord say that Boulder and the Heimdall are very good. And for 92 points, I can see their point very well. Uh, it's basically the same price as an Odin with less combo in the sense of uh, reducing the enemy citadel. Uh, but still very fast and with an additional uh, rocket uh, barrage to um, get your enemy a little bit more tender while you close the gap. In this sense, I, I do agree with them. I like the Balder. It's just that there are some better ships uh, that I consider on the side, depending on what you want to do. Which we will see the Thor, the Angrobot, uh, and the Loki. And I like those ships uh, better than the Balder. Uh, even the Gefion gives you more bang for your box, I think, with what you can build with this set. If it were the Boulder, for example, in the frontline uh, sprues of the Scandinavians, I would recommend it for sure. But here there's so many choices, I'm like, uh, I cannot recommend it to you with all my heart. If you like the appearance, though, I, there is nothing wrong with the Boulder. It's a good ship. But when you compare it to Bogmaur Flak Raider, which is 72 points, very cheap, but very fragile. Only six hull points in total, three in battle ready, three in crippled. And this thing uh, has a Freyare that you can replace. No, you cannot even replace the Freyare. It has 
uh, a Veerling Auto Cannon that you don't see here because it's a new ship that has just been added and it's not the right picture. I took the picture of the Baldor for this. Uh, but from what you can say, the, we replaced the Veerling Auto Cannon in the front. Oh, sorry, we replaced the Freyare that you can see here with the Veerling Auto Cannon. Okay. It has anti air specialist, which combos good with the Veerling and even the heavy storm claw that you have. Uh, if your opponent uh, is not careful, your fragile uh, air unit that are at closing or point blank will really not appreciate to be hunted down by those ships. And uh, it has flag barrage 5, okay, which really gives it a purpose. Uh, staying in the little, like, as a second wave kind of your Scandinavians because it's fragile. You don't want it to get focused down, even though 72 points, you're fine. And uh, flag barrage will really protect you if you have like two of the bog marrows. Um, it will really like uh, uh, remove a couple SLS tokens, which is very good. And between the Veerling and the auto cannon and the fact that you can use your heavy storm cloud more efficiently against aerials, it really gives you some good protection against aerial units. So all in all, I really like the Bogmaur and uh, I would recommend it more indeed than the Boulder, for example, because it fills a gap that is not uh, filled by other units. I'm really looking forward when it will be released so we can see what it really looks like. But yeah, we can we can really guess. And then we go to one of my favorite, maybe not the most efficient point per point, but it's so good. It is the Loki Shadow Raider. So the Loki is basically all like the same as all that we've seen before. So it has a heavy storm claw to the front. Okay. It has this rocket uh, that you can re uh, replace with a storm claw. You probably will want to do that, except if you really start to have a pack of three Lokis, then maybe Volgar batteries to get the enemy a bit more tender at closing can be reasonable as well. And the thing that I really like with the Loki uh, is that for a relatively cheap point cost of 100, uh, you get a ship with a shroud that has two very interesting rules, which is Shadow Hunter and the Ivaldi Shroud Generator. Let's start with Shadow Hunter. You know it already, probably. Uh, it means that after everybody has finished its deployment phase, um, you get to uh, redeploy left and right, wherever you want. Very, very strong rules. Uh, it means that you can deploy very aggressively and then redeploy on the complete other side of the table after your opponent has taken the bait. Or if your opponent decides to uh, ignore you, you can be like, okay, well, then I'm staying here and I'm indeed uh, breaching your flank, for example. So Shadow Hunter is very good for mind games, uh, which fits with the uh, Loki uh, personality. And the second thing that is extremely good is the Ivaldi Shroud Generator. And this means that, first of all, it's a Shroud Generator, always good. And it's basically a Mirage, uh, but boosted because Mirage uh, only uh, protects you, like, it protects you less than a Shroud. This is a real Shroud. And it also, like a Mirage, allows you as a special operation, so before you move, to teleport like there are no other ways like uh, you teleport within five inches of your original position it means that at the least if you go straight like it's a boost of five inches of speed which makes it crazy fast or uh, you can really play more tactically like if enemies charge you and you for some reason don't want to charge them you can retreat five inches very good or you can really like uh, go just behind an island and hide so the enemy doesn't shoot and with it's your time to activate you teleport just outside like on the side or you bypass or all together the island and then you can charge the enemy so it allows you to really make the maximum use of cover and uh, it's a, such a huge boost of maneuverability like ai <laughs> of course if i tell you that teleporting is a good boost to maneuverability um, <laughs> that didn't make a big uh, shocking revelation here but it still means that there is a huge uh, advantage to having Lokis because you can really play with terrain and keep a big threat on your opponent without having to just sail the high seas. The last reason I would like to recommend the Loki, it's more of a list building thing, is that when I build my Scandinavian, like pure Scandinavian list at 1500 or 2000 points, uh, it is divided in two parts. One part that will be in strategic reserve which will be the second battle fleet, uh, the one that can get this benefit, usually led by the Ragnarok, because the Ragnarok really wants uh, to be in strategic reserve. It does not want to be crossing the field. It's not taught, it's uh, quite fragile, like it wants to be in strategic reserve. And there will be the other fragile ships. We'll see the Thor in a minute. 
But yeah, all these ships that are fragile and are a bit worried about crossing the table will be in strategic reserve, little pack of uh, half and stuff. However, you do need to have your first battle fleet, which will be your Scandinavian River battle fleet, on the table. You will put there your Valhalla already on the table because uh, it's tougher than the Ragnarok and with the Shroud it, it can handle the pressure of being on the table turn one, especially if you put it some defenses to boost the ATV and stuff. But you also need some ships and uh, some of them, as we've said, really don't like to be exposed. Even the Jotun, they really like to be in strategic reserve. Uh, all these boarding point blank ships do not like to be uh, too exposed. The Loki, however, absolutely like, they even love to be not in strategic reserves because of Shadowhunter and the Ivaldi Shroud Generator. Because you will first of all gain kind of like a free activation during your uh, deployment phase because you can put your Yotuns, uh, sorry, your Lokis wherever you want and you can re just redeploy them. So it allows you to gain some time. And on the other side, uh, you do gain uh, the capacity of having this ship that gives you the first top couple turns while you wait for your reinforcements to arrive. You can really play them very uh, in a very catchy manner, staying behind islands, teleporting, and denying the enemy's line of sight. And even if he does get lines of sight on you, you are still a ship with eight hull points and a shroud. So you don't die that easily uh, for a hundred points. So yeah, I really like the Lokis as a partner unit. Uh, no, no, less than that. Not technically a partner unit as a companion unit for my Valhalla uh, for deploying on the table when I play pure Scandinavian. Another unit that really likes to be on the table turn one is the Angroboder, Ang Angroboda, a midget subcarrier, 100 points as well. Basically all the same as the Loki, except it replaces the rear uh, shroud generator with the capacity to send two slash one uh, midget subs. Uh, those are, it's basically the same capacity as an aircraft carrier, let's say. Uh, well, a little bit less, like two midget subs is inferior to four SRS tokens. Plus, they don't have as much range. But again, in the uh, in this theme of uh, having some cruisers on the table, turn one while waiting for your strategic reserves, uh, the Angry Bodas go very well alongside the Lokis in the way that you can play them defensively in the first couple turns, staying hidden behind islands. Yes, you do have Frey 9, which is very good. You do have heavy Stormclaw and probably you will put uh, Stormclaw as well, which means you are quite a f like you do have firepower, really. But you also can uh, contribute considerably against the enemies uh, in the first couple turns by sending your uh, SRS, like your midget subs tokens, uh, turn after turn. So again, another ship that I really like to have deployed turn one as Scandinavians. And then we go to the ship that does not want to be on the table turn one, the Thor Assault Raider. So this guy is 125 points and uh, it does have the same things exactly uh, defensively as all the other uh, profile. So 4 slash 4 hull points and Citadel 11 and Armor 6. Uh, this thing is a glass cannon. It's very fragile, it's very threatening. If you put it on the table, your opponent will either find line of sight to shoot him down or you will put SRS token to sink it. Uh, it is fragile and it is such a threat, like it cannot be ignored by your opponent. So don't make the mistake of putting it on the table, think like, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, no, it, it will get sunk down because uh, this guy is amazing at boarding. It has Frey 10, Wolves of the Sea as well, still, and it has a Fury Generator. Wow, <laughs> like this thing will just a single Thor on its own will do very good results at boarding. If you start to have two Thors, well, this <laughs> this uh, will start to bring the pain to... You can even make them separate boardings and uh, board two different cruisers. Uh, you have fairly good chance to succeed very well at both boardings. And it's not only a um, boarding beast, it also has storm veins, uh, which is uh, kind of like a storm generator, but a little bit less good. Um, it's a good secondary weapon, which brings a little bit of a utility. Uh, fine, uh, let's um, like keep it in mind that it, do it is not defenseless. Uh, but what it has, especially on top of its heavy stormclaw, because it of course still has its heavy stormclaw, is the colossal melee weapon, which boosts considerably its ramming capabilities. Uh, this really, it's really impressive 
how much uh, damage the Thor can do if it can uh, come from strategic reserve. Because each Thor, and it, you can multiply it by the number of Thor you have, will come out of strategic reserve. It is very, very fast, as you can see. It's basically uh, 11 plus 1, 12. Uh, it has Amor Suite for 13. It moves 13 from the sides. And uh, it will ram something because uh, good luck for your opponent to not be within 13 inches of either sides of the table on turn two. So it will ram something. It will do lots of damage, maybe destroying it. Then you can shoot, of course, with your broadside and your storm vein and stuff, but especially with your heavy storm claw uh, that you will boost, of course, with a smaller storm claw. It starts to be, uh, it starts to be oppressing. Then you will board the opponent. Which means that if you are lucky or efficient or whatever, it means you rammed a ship and crippled it, then you shot at a ship and crippled it, and then you boarded another ship and made a carnage and crippled it. I'm talking about uh, targets that are cruiser sized. So this little guy in a single activation, if everything goes well and your opponent put three targets in range on, can really pay itself back easily in a single activation. However, if you do deploy it on the table, uh, there is a big chance that your opponent will really not leave you the chance to come so close and he will sink, sink it either with long range weaponries or with SLS token. Because it is expensive, it is fragile, and when you consider the amount of damage it can deal, uh, this is probably going to be, if I were the opponent of the Scandinavians, uh, one of the ships on which I would put my own SLS token to sink it down as soon as possible. Plus, I quite, like, I really do like the design of the Thor. It looks amazing. I just love it. When I play Scandinavians, it's always hard and heartbreaking if I cannot include at least one Thor in strategic reserve alongside the Ragnarok in my list. Because come on, it's so thematic and it's so fun to play. For the next unit, we really need to take a look at the weapon statistics to understand how to use it. And the next unit is the Hoth Heavy Corvette. Uh, this is the smallest unit that you can make with the uh, Scandinavian Frontline Sprue and it is fragile, let's not lie. It has Armor 4, Citadel 10, 3 hull points, so nothing crazy. For 34 points, uh, it is on the expensive side uh, with, uh, for a ship with Armor 4. However, it does have some very, very interesting things going for it. First of all, uh, it has what is called Acceptable Attrition. Uh, which means that when you have a minimum sized unit, which is two, and they get destroyed, you don't uh, give any victory points to your opponent. That is important because this ship, one of the two ways to play it really, is to attach it to any Scandinavian ship, not only a flagship, any Scandinavian. So that is really, really important actually, because it means that you can do this without having the fear of giving very easy points to your opponent. And um, it is also a good ship to be used as a, in a big pack. Uh, it can go uh, with up to, up to six models per unit. And in this uh, sense, they are vulnerable still with armor 4. However, however, they are still mass 1, so it's still annoying to uh, shoot at them with uh, heavy gun batteries because they will be obscured against any gunnery weapons, uh, as always. And they will really have high defense values because they will reinforce each other. So they have ADV3 uh, and SDV3. So let's say they are all in range of each other. Uh, that is going to go to up to uh, ADV and SDV8. Great. And they have each of them Corvette duty. So you can put another five. So they're going to have ADV13 and SDV13 when they are all in a big pack next to each other. So needless to say, they are virtually uh, invincible against any rockets or torpedoes or any... Uh, weapons that will trigger their ADV or SDV. You will really need to bring an absolute rain of rockets to destroy one and at 34 points per model you don't want to do that at all. So they can be extremely annoying to deal with uh, when packed uh, because you have almost no good weapon against them except blast weapons. But if your opponent has blast weapons and you have a big pack of off, of course spread them out. Those ships are good at two things, shooting at point blank with their very good storm cloud, which is uh, this weapon that you can see here. So 5-3 at point blank, which means that as you can uh, imagine, that's gonna be um, 20 dices at point blank with a full pack. Uh, gunnery, okay, devastating, wow, and arc. 
And the thing they have is advanced storm coils, which give them, on top of that, sustained. So having sustained on a devastating weapon is always good, because each reroll gives you more chance to gain that almighty six on your dice roll. And yeah, that's just a great weapon from the start. And they also have base fray six, which means that a huge pack can make one absolutely devastating boarding, or you can even make two different boardings uh, quite comfortably. Um, if you make a full pack of six, two different boardings, uh, that's going to be There's going to be Frey 10 base for each boarding, fine, but also with Wolves of the Sea, you can have quite a bit more. So Frey 10 with Wolves of the Sea giving you a bit more boost and re-rolling blanks, uh, that is going to be quite a threat to quite a lot of ships. So already a very good unit. And the thing that uh, I want to point out is that since they have advanced storm calls and they get sustained on their storm cloud, it means they are really made to go alongside ships that have a Stormbringer. They are not made to be attached, well, they are less made to be attached to ships that have Stormclaw or Heavy Stormclaw, because then they will not be able to link all together. So be aware of that. For example, the Valhalla and the Ragnarok, the flagships, do have Stormbringers. Uh, so do, for example, the Teutonic uh, ship uh, that has a Stormbringer. I um, don't remember the name right now, but one of the Teutonic ship has a Stormbringer and it can get the Scandinavian keyword. So then it works, but be careful uh, not to attach it to just any unit you see, even though with acceptable attrition and then being very able to spam in Scandinavian fleets, uh, you are allowed to spam them quite a little bit. So. Both ways are really good to uh, to use, uh, either the large pike, either you spread them out and you attach them left and right. It's always good, even if it's a unit that cannot link because they have only heavy storm glow, for example. Uh, even this type of unit will benefit from having a corvette to boost the fray, first of all, to give more defenses thanks to corvette duty. And overall, like it also looks really good on the table. So I really, really like the hoth. They are not the bread and butter, I would say, but they are so important in every Scandinavian list because Scandinavians are fragile and being able to give some more uh, boost to the fray and plus three to the defense of any unit you choose is actually really important if you do want to be able to cross the barrage of torpedoes or rockets of your opponents and to really maximize your chance to do a lot of good boardings once you reach the enemy. Next unit that you will get in this uh, box is the Fenrir Hunter Submarine. And this is also very interesting uh, for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, um, well, the first thing to note, though, is that it's even more fragile <laughs> than the poor Hoth, because it has also Armor Force Tel 10, but it has only two hull points. So eight hits and is going down. It's really, really, <laughs> really fragile. It's a uh, submerged bottom S1, so it would be anyway obscured against gunnery. And with ADV of 1 and SDV of 2, uh, it is going to be vulnerable, uh, especially against uh, torpedoes, let's be honest. Uh, this poor thing will not uh, win a lot uh, any uh, torpedo duels, but that's not what you buy it. You will buy it because it is one of the very, very few Scandinavian units that does want to stay all the way to the back all game long and provide some extreme range firepower with the spear schluders. And uh, it can be quite offensive oriented. It does like to be in a large pack of six because, again, it will boost its SDV and it really needs it if he's going to engage in torpedo duels against another unit of submarines, for example. Uh, and it also has pack hunter. So being in a very uh, large pack of like four or six of them, which is what I would recommend, will allow you to do a lot more damage and also to survive longer. Something to take into consideration. And extreme range blast weapons are fortunately quite rare, so you can be quite confident in packing them up. They also have Vanguard, which I don't understand because that's exactly a unit that wants to stay very far away from the opponent. So why would you give it Vanguard? I don't know. It's not in the fluff. Um, well, you can have your own opinion, but with Frey 3 and not having Wolves of the Sea, you don't want to get close to your opponent at all. Though it can maybe, depending on how you set up your table, allow you to cross a little bit, uh, go very fast out of your deployment zone and hide behind a Central Islands uh, cover. 
even though like the best thing to do is still, as with all submarines and extreme range weapons, to just stay in your deployment zone with good firing angles and just stay in this area all game long. Also, I really like the appearance of this ship all over. Uh, overall, it's it is still very interesting in the sense that it is cheap. It's a very cheap activation. If you put only two of those, um, it's gonna give you a, one of the cheapest activation you can get. And it's also very good in a pack of four. It's still quite cheap, 120 points, still gonna do some damage. And again, it complements very well uh, what, because it will be the one of the few units that you will keep in the back while all the rest of your fleet goes forward. Then we go to a very, very interesting unit with the Valkyrie Hunt Rotor. This one, uh, has uh, quite some choice of weapon and it has some good combo. We talked about it already with the Odin. Uh, it can be attached to an Odin class cruiser and when it does, they do get a lot of bonus. Let's remember that when you shoot at a unit uh, with an Odin uh, against a unit that is visible to any Valkyrie, you, uh, the enemy has minus two to their citadel, so that's already huge. And the Valkyrie in itself is already a good unit. Uh, you have um, two of those in the box and they can go up to a squadron of four and when they get at point blank, boy do they bring the pain. They have a heavy storm claw which is 7-5 which means that when you have a lower, big pack you will have uh, 22 dices, gunnery devastating arc. Wow, that is a lot, uh, but you wouldn't expect any less for 42 points per model. Uh, it is barely more resilient uh, than for example a hoth with armor 5, citadel 11 eh? uh, and hull points 3. So it is fragile for the point cost. Being aerial, it's hard to put into cover. However, it, it does, it is worth its points just to trigger this combo with the Odin. If you don't have any Odins, uh, maybe think uh, really deeply what you want to do uh, before you put a lot of Valkyries on the table. They also have a Rudiger autocannon, bringing a little bit more even uh, firepower at point blank range. And you can replace your heavy storm cloud uh, with some heavy shock rocket batteries, which look amazing and give it more role of a long range fire support, but then you really don't get to use your Rudiger autocannon, and I'm not sure it's great. If you don't want to attach them to your Odin, or you have, for example, not many uh, Valkyries and you have a lot of Odins, it's good to keep some of them in the rear, very far away uh, with the rocket, so they can really trigger uh, the combo with the Odin for basically the whole table. Um, and uh, yeah, that's good. But uh, otherwise, I would always recommend the Heavy Storm Cloud, which is the one that you see on the picture. Uh, it is such a better unit because it really goes with everything it wants to do. It wants to be at point blank for the, its great free value. It's uh, considered that it can board aerial units. And as you've seen in our huge Siege of the Twin Citadels, it can <laughs> bring down an entire Zeppelin uh, fortress uh, on its own. No, not on its own at all, but it, it can board and it's very efficient in doing that. Uh, it can get great firepower at point blank, and this way the Odin wants to be at point blank as well, and the Valkyrie can really accompany it in this way with a heavy storm cloud. Overall, uh, quite a good unit, I like it, but like all the Scandinavians, it's more or less of a glass cannon. Uh, it is very good at point blank, it's very hard to reach uh, the point blank, and some armies really don't like to do that, like I'm thinking of the, for example, the Union, which has glass cannon, but it, they have a few glass cannons and the rest are very tough. So of course the target priority is quite obvious for your opponent. But the Valkyries, they are glass cannon, but they're a little bit annoying to deal with still. And the, uh, all your, or your army is going to be charging forward. So if you don't use them as mercenaries, uh, they have a quite good chance to reach the enemy lines uh, without any problem. And uh, again, if you put, for example, them in strategic reserve alongside an attached Odin, uh, they can be a very, very threatening package going out in the side of your enemy's line. And finally, uh, but for sure not least, the last unit that you get is the Heinear Vitruvian Colossus. Uh, you get two of those Colossi in the box, and they are probably my favorite uh, Colossi of the entire game. First of all, they look amazing, uh, as you can see. Uh, much better, in my opinion, than uh, the Prussian Colossus. And they are also, uh, and that's uh, what I think, easier to play and more fun both for you and for your opponent. Uh, why is that? Because the Prussian uh, robots and also the marina for the um, Commonwealth, for example, and uh, the giant squids for the Empire, they are made only for ramming, basically. And that's, there is not much you can do against this. 
and, uh, against ramming and it's frustrating for your opponent. It's very strong, it's very hard to counter and then that's it and you're just kind of like laying there and be like okay but I need to find another target or go back into the shadows and come back next turn and it's uh, kind of like it's not very fun for either player I think. This is much better because this uh, Colossus is very much an hybrid and it it, uh, it is not great well at any uh, specific uh, phase but it's good at all of them so it will have a good ramming action with its colossal melee weapon and all the good keywords such as John Ao and the bleach slag uh, special rule so that is very good already uh, that's what you like uh, to punch the enemy ship with your big axe but then it also has very very good shooting with two heavy volt gun batteries that it does not need to get rid of to get a shield generator. So that's gonna go into the durability that we'll talk about later. So that's already good. Two heavy volt gun batteries per uh, ein AR, very good. It also, and that's the big one, has a Uber Volt Veerling. It's this giant Gatling that he has on the left. Uh, it has, when it's crippled, when it goes out of the water, 10-6, already great. And when it uh, is uh, not in a battle already, it is 16-7. So that's gonna be something <laughs> like 23 dices, sustained Voltaic, uh, if you have two of those ships together. Uh, that is already great and you can absolutely and that's e maybe even better to put two different attacks at 16 if you have a unit of two of those together that is crazy firepower and that makes me uh, want to say that this is not a ship that you want to focus only on the melee but you want to put them somewhere a little bit safe ish uh, so they can destroy your carrier when they arrive okay but then they can survive the counter attack and that's that's the way they are very different from other uh, robots from the Imperium. They want to be deployed a little bit safely to survive the attack and next turn to be able to shoot with their Uber Volt Veerling and maybe do another ramming and frail action, of course, but you want those guys to survive. Even if the enemy is at uh, middle range, like um, closing range, it's still gonna be two attacks at 15 dices, which is still gonna be basic with sustain. It's still going to be basically a critical on uh, any battleship, e even heavy battleships, uh, will uh, get a critical from this. And with Voltaic, it goes even more into the playstyle of the Imperium. That's great. They also have Frey 9, which is very, very good. And it means you can really do lots of damage, especially in enemy Colossus, if you aim with them, with the good uh, special rules that you have. But with Walls of the Sea, you can just basically hunt anything with your great Frey value. So that is a ship that will come ram something, shoot something, board something, uh, maybe the same unit uh, every time, maybe uh, lots of different uh, small ships, for example, and then it will try to stay alive, and it has fair chances to do, because if you don't deploy just in front of the enemy fleet, you have armor 8, amazing, still 14, still fine, you have 5 slash 4 hull points, also quite good for Colossus, I would say, uh, there's been way worse around and especially you have also a shield generator which means that uh, again if you're quite conservative it is going to take quite a lot of firepower for your opponent to uh, do uh, tons of damage against you the best uh, idea for your opponent would be to send a lot of torpedoes for example to avoid uh, your uh, shield and you have only sdv2 which is not great at all but uh, then it means that your opponent is using torpedoes uh, quite uh, against enemies in their back and usually torpedoes are forward uh, mounted so it's quite hard for your opponent to make a 3 like 180 and to point their torpedoes at you if you spawn behind them so overall I absolutely love the Einer Haya sorry for the name uh, and um, probably Probably my favorite Scandinavian unit alongside the Valhalla. It is such a great fun to, to play. It looks amazing and it will bring a lot of interesting puzzles for your opponent because there are ways to uh, counter it. it uh, you will have to play it conservatively and it's not like a one uh, action tissue that you could just throw away once it had obliterated the enemy uh, massive aircraft carrier. It is something that needs a little bit of play and can be uh, countered with a little bit of counterplay. So overall, I absolutely love this unit, its rules and its design. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what you can get after the science of Jutlin box. So either uh, this is your first box or you want to make a bigger purchase uh, for example through my place to get all the Scandinavians you need in a single purchase. 
what do you want more if you already have the signs of Jutland Box and you like the gameplay and you want a little bit more? For me, there was there is one answer that is really in front of all the others. It's quite rare that it's so obvious, but here it really is. It is the Ragnarok Battlefleet set. Uh, this is uh, absolutely vital if you really are serious about getting a 2,000 point Scandinavian elite. Uh, this will give you more frontline cruisers, and we've seen that you do like all of them. The Jotuns, the Odin, the Gungnir, all of them are very good for different reasons. And uh, I would even say like you will want even more than uh, just four frontline cruisers, but that's just me. You get four more half heavy corvettes, and again, we've seen how important it is. Uh, this it will mean that uh, if you have eight uh, half you can make one big pack of six to use it as we said and a little pack of two that you will be able to attach for example on your valhalla to boost its firepower and to bring it more uh, anti-torpedo defenses which is really it will want this uh, as it crosses the table because you will give the valhalla a shroud and the torpedoes will be the obvious answer to counter it so you will want some hot to help and some of course escort tokens and finally you get the ragnarok and this is really a good ship um, it's basically a smaller valhalla it has one less turret one less drum rigger but it's cheaper and it's also a very good boarding ship the one thing it does not have is any reason to be on the table turn one it really wants to be in strategic reserve because it doesn't have no, it, does, it rarely will have a shroud uh, because then you really start to don't have much firepower at all with your gun batteries it will uh, not have any submarines to send at long range uh, so it really wants to be in strategic reserve uh, it also has a very good named uh, variance it's 30 points more but you get a lot more you get focus gunnery you get a lot of good keywords and rules uh, with the named variant of the ragnarok and if you want to play 2000 points or 1500 points of uh, scandinavians the great combo is to have one fleet on the table a scandinavian frontline fleet with the valhalla so all the ships which we talked about on the table and then you make a generic imperium fleet led by the ragnarok with ships such as, for example, the Thor or any ship that you want at point blank, and they are fragile, so it has the Jotun as well if you want. You put all of those in a strategic reserve alongside the Ragnarok, and then you can really make one big charge on the side of the opponent turn two. So that's really my recommendation on how to play the Scandinavians if you want to play pure Scandinavians. And yeah, the Valhalla plus Ragnarok combo is such a it, it, it's, you can feel that it was designed to be kind of like a hammer and anvil uh, gameplay. And yeah, they combo so greatly together, whether in times in terms of design, but also in terms of gameplay. So really highly recommended. It. It's 54 euros for the Ragnarok Battlefleet set. So again, if you get minus 10% from my OB place, it's gonna be less than 50 euros. The second great set is going to be the Imperium Starter set uh, that is uh, quite generic but good battlefield to go alongside your Scandinavian. Do note that it's not a pure Scandinavian list anymore, but the Imperium starter set is good because it's great value and it will also uh, complement well uh, the weakness of your Scandinavians, which is they are fragile. It's quite hard for them to uh, stay in the center of the table around the objectives and stay alive. Uh, guess what? The Prussians do this really, really well. You're going to get an Elector battleship, which is this big one that you can see right there. Uh, this one is tough from the beginning, and it has some even tougher version. Uh, you have the extremely tough Kaiser Elector with uh, ablative armor. You can give it a shield. It can be absolutely naughty to uh, attack. And then there is also the named uh, variant, the Tirpitz, which has a shroud, which is kind of like the Mirage, or like exactly like the Loki, actually, which means you get a shroud, which is uh, okay, like quite fine. You have ablative armor, but can help sometimes and especially this very slow ship can teleport five inches each activation um, I thought it was not so strong and I actually uh, saw it being played and I was like wow this is a game changer for the Kaiser Elector really so absolutely amazing battleship that will hold the center and require absolutely ridiculous amount of firepower to get dealt with you get two Prussian frontline cruisers uh, you have the basic blusher, which is good. Uh, you can have the escort one, uh, the Schomburg, you, the artillery variant, uh, the Augustus, quite good. Not the best artillery ship in the game, but still quite good, especially since all your Scandinavians and your Elector will be charging. So it's good to have good artillery ships in the back uh, to cover your rear, kind of. 
you will have two Prussian support cruisers. Uh, the carriers are quite fine because you will uh, be lacking a little bit in SRS, so it's good to have the Conrad aircraft carriers. You have the great, great writers, uh, which are the anti-aircraft version. Uh, good against uh, big airships and they also have flag barrage which is something you will really like especially if the enemy targets for example your very expensive Valhalla with massive air raids then you will be happy to have a writer around you have a very good mass one the Imperium has amazing mass ones all of them the Arminius are already very very good they are extremely cheap and fast and they're also good at boarding good at shooting like they're great and the Prussian destroyers there are two variants both of them are amazing especially the Toten destroyers which are some of the best mass ones in the game no questions asked uh, they've got nerfed after nerf and they're still extremely strong uh, for the point cost they are a little bit fragile as well but pff, this thing will just obliterate anything at point blanks with shooting and they're also of course very good at boarding and then you get all the stuff that you usually have in the starter sets you get movement tools you get of course uh, SRS tokens and blitz and bomber tokens also because your Conrad can be a bomber carrier you get a world map of the dystopian wars you get some cards like everything that you need to play uh, the game so great uh, starter set 72 euros is a very good deal you get quite a lot of points in this but be aware again this will uh, turn you away from a pure Scandinavian fleet and the Prussian ships can not be part of the science of Jutland mercenary battle fleet. The Ragnarok, all the ships can be mercenaries uh, except the Ragnarok itself, but the Imperium starter set, nope. And finally, something that, <laughs> that I really like and I cannot not recommend is the Zeppelin battle fleet set. So those ships are going to give you a lot of what you uh, lack, also, um, which is aerial units. You only have the Valkyries uh, from the start. And with this, you will have a massive Prussian Air Force. Uh, first of all, you will have the, the Zeppelin, which is one of the variants of the massive airship that you can get. The Zeppelin is an uh, aerial artillery ship uh, with a lot of rockets, uh, which is already good because, again, we know that this is something that you lack. However, there is a new ship that has been uh, teased and announced, we don't have the rules yet, which is the Maximilian uh, Aerial Linebreaker, which is basically a Zeppelin Dreadnought with a shield, uh, with a, a long-range artillery, like uh, cannons on top of the rockets. Well, it's going to be insane. And it's sold in a unique box, like you can just buy this single flagship, which is unique. So maybe don't build the Zeppelin with this a Zeppelin Battlefleet set. And you can also build uh, the other variant, which I would recommend, which is the one on the picture here, which is the Stark Imperium uh, Aerial Fortress. I forgot the name, but it's basically a Zeppelin aircraft carrier, which is an amazing concept in and of itself. And this is what I would recommend. It still has a Sturmbringer to uh, deter the enemy that could get too close, but it also has quite good flag barrage. It can send a lot of SRS token. It's basically an Avalon, but better, uh, if I sum it up. And uh, you can use it really try to hide behind aerial islands if you uh, have some of them. Otherwise, uh, the enemy will be way enough busy with uh, your first line of Scandinavians to not have the time to focus on the Stark Imperium. Uh, and once you get close, um, you can charge alongside and then make a good use of your Sturmbringer and you're actually quite fine uh, free value. There is a named variant of the Stark Imperium which has even better free, which goes again quite well on the theme of your Scandinavians. You're gonna have two mass two uh, Zeppelin cruisers. Uh, you can, well, I will not go too much in detail, but one of them has again a Sturmbringer or heavy Sturmklok, I, I think it's a Sturmbringer. So goes very well charging down alongside your Scandinavians because then you can really like overload your enemy's defenses. He will not be able to shoot all of you uh, before you get at point blank and start boarding and stuff and shooting especially. Or you can bring your cruiser into a torpedo variant that will uh, stay all the way in the back, be extremely annoying to remove for your opponents because it will be hard to be at good range for them because they are uh, extreme range and aerial and they can be kind of like the same role as the Augustus um, artillery cruiser or the Fenrir hunter submarines. So their role is to stay all the way in the back and provide uh, fire support while the rest of your fleet charges forward. And then you have four uh, Zeppelin frigates um, Spoiler, build the Munich variant. It's absolutely insane. Uh, it's probably the best mess one uh, still. It's, again, it's got some nerf, 
but uh, it's still probably the best uh, Aerial mess one and maybe the best mess one all uh, position traits uh, combined. Uh, it's extremely fast. It will obliterate anything that it gets at point blank, even heavy battleships. Uh, it is a bit fragile, yes, but it's relatively cheap for what it does. Uh, it's so fast you cannot hide from it. You cannot run away from it. It will find you and kill you at point blank, uh, no questions asked. So no long range variant for this, but just put the Munich a little bit behind your Scandinavians and the enemy will really have a tough choice uh, choosing its target. Uh, if you can put them in strategic reserve alongside your Ragnarok, for example, if you have, it's even better. Uh, then you will have also some Felished Escort tokens, which is these very small uh, ones uh, here. They're adorable and uh, you can put them alongside your Zeppelin, like Stark Imperium aircraft carriers, uh, because that's quite good. Or you can also put the Felished uh, on your surface units, because most of them can uh, have some escort token upgraded to Flicht. So if you don't have enough escort tokens in the signs of Jutland box, which can happen, uh, you can use those absolutely also to cover your surface units. Overall, for 66 euros, you do get quite a lot of ships. Uh, all of them are in plastic, including the massive Mass 4 uh, Zeppelin Flying Fortress, which is really cool. It's a great kit. And you will also, a little bonus, uh, get too many bits to get all the different variants etc so you will have one or even two landing pads like this uh, extra and you can really use a lot of bits from this box to build terrains and make some custom islands uh, for your table so little bonus to consider here and uh, if you use the discount code it's going to be less than 60 euros uh, on my place for example and uh, yeah that's going to be great and uh, i would highly recommend to get this if you want some aerial ships because you love the idea of having some zeppelins alongside your scandinavian force and that is going to be it for today i hope you found this video informative overall i mean come on just look at this artwork the scandinavians look amazing they're certainly in my top five of any sub factions in the dystopian age maybe even the maybe even in the top three uh, I love them very, very much, both from a design point of view and from a gameplay point of view. All their units are well thought of, and uh, they are quite balanced and very fun both to play as and to play against, which is something really important when you're trying to have a good Saturday afternoon with your friends. I highly recommend uh, that you convince at least one player in your gaming group to get those because they are just so much fun on the table. And also they can be as uh, mercenaries. So even if you play another faction, it's quite fine to buy just this specific box of the Imperium to get some mercenaries. There are a lot of factions that are great at long range and putting uh, some uh, heavy artillery pressure on the opponents that are not so good at putting like deep strikers or really charging the opponents. I'm thinking, for example, as at, uh, the Commonwealth, which has some options, but not too much. The Crown also is not great at point blank uh, aggression and boarding, etc. Well, for those factions, it's really, really great to have uh, the uh, science of Jutland as mercenaries. So overall, a great, great box. It is expensive, yes, but you have so much as you've seen, so many miniatures in there. So uh, overall, a great box from War Cradle. Uh, do you plan to get those either as pure Scandinavians? Uh, let us know. Do you plan to get them as mercenaries? Also, let us know in the comments. Uh, do know that by putting a comment, you gain a chance to win uh, two entire battle fleets uh, in our little uh, contest of the winter or the spring, depending on when you type uh, your comment. Thank you very much for having watched until the end. Take care of yourself and until the next video, remember to keep spreading the love all around. Bye!